Good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm a professor of psychiatry at the University of Washington. I'm a clinical psychologist by training, but at UW, I direct the Bright Center, which stands for Behavioral Research and Technology and Engineering. It's the university's attempt at a strategic investment in cross-departmental, cross-disciplinary focus on technology and mental health. And so I'll tell you a little bit about the work that we do there, but really the objective of this talk is to cast a bit of a vision, to talk a little bit about where I see the future of mental health um, it's relevant to the discussion that we heard yesterday with, with uh, Kosla about what, what the natural evolution is of technology and mental health and where some of the limitations are in the way that we approach things and how we may be able to change that. So a quick disclosure slide. Okay, disclosed. So um, the, from a Clinician and clinical researcher perspective, I think I just want to set the baseline in the context for the talk. The way that we know what we know about psychopathology is linked to the methods that we collect the information, right? And so the standard practice is that we ask someone to come into the clinic and give us a description in the moment about what they're thinking and feeling. And usually, we will uh, see them in their worst state, right? They're either already getting services or they're in the ER, or they're in a jail cell, right? And so we capture that snapshot, and based on our impressions of that, we assume that this is the person continuously and chronically. And that's how you arrive at statements like calling someone delusional, rather than someone experienced a delusion last Wednesday at X intensity, and that may fluctuate. And some of the research that we're doing already shows that our basic assumptions, the premise that we have around many forms of psychiatric illnesses, is just not anchored in the real manifestation of illness. So from there to what, why we do what we do, and especially when we're thinking about psychosocial intervention, psychotherapies, really we're talking about 19th century technology. Right? We ask people to come to us, to the clinic, a brick and mortar facility, there's a fixed schedule. We sit with them and we impart our wisdom. We're really hoping that they're attending to it, that they have the mental and emotional capacity in the moment to internalize and integrate this into their behavioral repertoire. They leave the clinic out into the real world and they do really well in the remaining 23 hours of the day and the other six days of the week. And the problem with that is that it just doesn't happen, right? With the, the, by and large, we are terrible at mental health interventions, and we've done very, very relatively little for too few for too long. That's from the insider perspective of clinical research. We are really not good overall at what we do. And so many, many interventions have been stagnant for very long. I think a key part of that are the limitations of the technologies that we've had to work with. But that's changing, right? And so we're all alive to witness the fastest adoption of technology in recorded human history. If we're thinking, if the UN estimated back in 2001 that there were about a billion mobile phones worldwide, the estimate of the ITU was that at the end of 2017, there are over seven billion mobile phones. That, from a healthcare perspective, across the board, certainly when it comes to access to behavioral health interventions, which are can be conversational in nature, that is an enormous opportunity for us. For the first time ever, people that potentially were out of reach are now within a mobile cellular grid, and they can reach us or reach resources in real time or close to real time, which is well beyond the confines of a brick and mortar clinic. And so it's an opportunity to fundamentally reconfigure the way that we study psychopathology and that we intervene. That's what we try to do at the Bright Center, right? That's our mission. We try to capitalize on the natural evolution of technology, anything from very simple interventions where we repurpose existing technology, things like SMS, to invent interventions between live clinicians, the old model, and patients, but remotely, out there in the community. And I'll provide examples for each one of these to just bring them to life a little bit. So those at the lowest rung of that evolutionary ladder, th these are person-to-person -person interactions, right? A live person with another live person can be in real time, can be asynchronous. As we ascend up that ladder, uh, that's where we focus on development of new technologies. And so things like uh, digital health apps, 
that are focused on treating someone with schizophrenia to manage their symptoms or to support their recovery or vocational rehabilitation. And these kinds of automated inter interventions, they're very overt and clearly visible. The patient knows that they're interacting with a technology based on their responses to certain questions. Algorithms will take them almost like a choose your own adventure intervention strategy. So it's very clear what's happening in the moment, but that moment might occur in short bursts multiple times throughout the day. So it is a lower intensity, but much higher frequency of intervention modality. But then getting fancier and fancier technologically, that's when we move into the area of combinations of sensing and signal detection and data sharing with providers, healthcare systems. That's where things start becoming invisible. And so the idea here is to try to capitalize on the naturally occurring digital behavior of the individual, model their behavior, infer behavior, and try to identify points of intervention in a, in a just-in-time way. And so capturing someone as they're becoming vulnerable or ideally preceding that and intervening at a meaningful time point rather than shooting in the dark. And I'll give you examples for that as well. Okay, but back to that lower rung. To bring this to life a little bit, I'll tell you about uh, an intervention strategy that we've developed called the mobile interventionist. The idea is to retrain community-based case managers. So intentionally people who are out there in community mental health centers who are already providing services for folks with serious mental illness who are often Medicaid recipients, right? People with low functioning, with limited income, who are getting services in the public sector. And so the way an intervention day may start, and these are actual quotes from one of our trials, is Sarah, the mobile interventionist, might send out a text message and she'll say, hi, it's Sarah, how are you feeling, Ray? And so Ray responds two hours later because this is an asynchronous conversation and he has the option to respond later in the day, not constraining the intervention period, right? Hi, Sarah, voices are talking about me. By voices, he means auditory hallucinations. Ray has a psychotic disorder. And so Sarah responds within a few minutes, that's stressful, normalizing his experience. You're not alone. Lots of people hear voices. And so Ray responds, and I'm paraphrasing here because it's an actual quote, they say something bad will happen to me if I take the bus. So Ray just provided a target, right? a concrete, out in the real world experience where he says, I experience this distressing symptom primarily in this context. That's almost like an invitation for Sarah, right? So Sarah notices this and jumps into action. I have a trick that can help you relax, even if voices are around. You can use it on the bus. Do you want to hear about it? And so Ray responds with a semi-enthusiastic maybe. What is it? That's the window of opportunity. Right? That's where Sarah can talk to him via text about relaxation strategies, can coordinate a time where she's texting while he gets back on the bus. While he's on the bus and exercising these relaxation strategies, she also learns that the real fear is that he's sure that the bus driver wants to poison him. Working through that, she's able to support him, and off he goes. And Ray was able to get back to riding the bus to the community center, which is a very meaningful piece in his life, especially for someone who's terribly socially isolated the way that Ray is. And so when we started this project, aside from the clinical outcomes like reduction in hospitalization and self-reported symptoms, which are the usual targets, what I wasn't sure about was, are we even able to create a therapeutic relationship, a therapeutic alliance between a provider and a patient entirely via text. That's very counterintuitive for most clinicians, right? We, we like to think that the, the human touch and our ability to lean in when necessary um, is essential for these things. And so we administered a measure for a therapeutic alliance called the Working Alliance Inventory. Really what this gets at are these relational things between a clinician and a patient. Uh, things like, I'm confident in my clinician's ability to help me, I believe my clinician likes me, these are often predictors of engagement in care and of clinical outcomes. And we administer this measure twice to patients in our trial. Once we ask them to rate their in-person clinical team. Now these are folks who have been in care for many years, some of them for eight years with the same clinical team. 
The other time, we ask them to rate their texting mobile interventionist, that person that they meet only once in person at the beginning of a three-month intervention, and from that point on, everything is through text. And so they rated both of them high. They rated the texting interventionist as significantly better. So we certainly can, can establish a therapeutic alliance through text. OK. As we go up into these automated interventions, I'll tell you a little bit about a smartphone app that we've been developing and evolving um, and has luckily been very well grant fund funded over the years called Focus. Focus is a smartphone application specifically designed for people with serious mental illness. It looks at five target areas that branch out into smaller intervention areas. So voices or auditory hallucinations, similar to what Ray responded to. Medication, which means not only medication adherence, but also content focusing on how to strike up a conversation with your prescriber about medications, maybe about your concerns about side effects. So from our perspective, more medication is not necessarily better. It really depends. Uh, mood, which really means anxiety or depression, depending on what people endorse. Social functioning, which really means social skills training, or coping with things like paranoid ideation that might get in the way of someone interacting with others socially. And sleep, which is sleep hygiene. Now, people can get prompted throughout the day to respond to questions, but all the content of focus is also available 24-7 on the device, regardless of whether you have internet connectivity or not. So that's quite intentional, thinking about our target audience, who may or may not have data plans, or may or may not be living in areas that have connectivity on a regular basis. How does focus work? It'll prompt the individual multiple times throughout the day. In this, taking over the home screen, in this case, Focus will ask, can you check in with Focus right now? And if the individual says yes, it'll launch immediately into the assessment that was calibrated to that individual based on their baseline report of illness. And so in this case, Focus asks, hello, Rachel, have you been bothered by voices today? And the idea is to never capture things that the time frame is too long, right? We don't want that retrospective bias that we might get in asking people about how they've been feeling over the last week or month. Always short time frames. So here, Rachel responds using her multiple choice response options that she's been moderately bothered by voices. And so now focus digs in a little bit, looking at the cognitive distortions that Rachel might have around those voices. Those are the target for intervention. That's really what increases someone's distress. How would you describe your voices? They can't be controlled. They know everything. They're powerful. They're unpleasant or something else. And these content, these domains are drawn right out of CBT for psychosis. These are our, 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 our usual suspects when we think of ways to intervene. Here, Rachel says, I think my voices know everything. And so now, Really, that's the extent of the assessment. It is very brief and very targeted. And then Focus gives them an option to either read about an intervention in a sequence of slides or see an intervention. And seeing an intervention can look something like this. Voices make mistakes all the time. Try this experiment to test your voices. Ask them to make a prediction about the color of the next three cars that you see in the street. Write down the colors and the order that the voice is saying. Now, test it. Are the next three cars exactly in the same order of colors that they mentioned? If they got it wrong, think about it. What else could the voices be getting wrong? Their predictions are not always right. So the objective is to try to capitalize on things that are in their immediate environment and give quick and dirty tools to gradually start chiseling away at, in some cases, for beliefs that have been very, very long held, giving people an arsenal of these tools to manage illness. OK. So uh, we ran a bunch of studies with Focus. We've evolved it over time. We've refined it. We've used user-centered design. It's currently being implemented um, in the state of Washington across 20 sites. But really, from a, an effectiveness perspective, the most compelling findings came from a comparative effectiveness trial that was funded by uh, PCORI a couple of years ago, where we, put, we wanted to put focus toe-to-toe -to -toe against more traditional clinic-based care. 
And so we ran an RCT where people were either randomized into the focus mobile health arm or they were randomized into RAP wellness recovery action planning. It's a widely used group intervention in clinics. And so three months of an intervention period, collected data before, after intervention, and at follow-up. And clinically, long story short, we found no difference, no significant differences in clinical outcomes or satisfaction ratings between either of these conditions. Both improved recovery, both reduced depressive symptoms, both reduced general symptoms of psychopathology. The satisfaction ratings were remarkably similar to both. The modalities of intervent intervention, though, are dramatically different. One requires you to come to a clinic, negotiate traffic, sit with a group of people, engage with a therapist for 90-minute sessions. The other one is entirely remotely based on your smartphone with calls once a week for brief, brief M health support specialist if you have technical problems. But for the most part, the intervention runs with the individual. The individual navigates the intervention. And so aside from the clinical outcomes, the real kicker of the study was this. After randomization, we wanted to see who actually follows up with care, right? Once you, this is the equivalent of in a clinic when you prescribe a treatment for someone, what do they do from that point on? Because we know that it's a huge vulnerability for healthcare systems that people never follow up. And so in the, the blue represents people in the focus arm, the mobile health arm, who are assigned, who learn that they're assigned to mobile health as part of the study. And we saw that 90% of them go on and actually meet with a support specialist and get set up with a mobile health intervention and, and commence treatment. Whereas only 58% of people assigned to clinic-based care ever make it in for a single session from that point on. Now that's very meaningful, not only for focus, but for mobile health or digital health in general. That means that before even know, if people know, even know about the content of the intervention or the, or the nature of their, of their clinician or the room that they'll be getting services, cl close to 50% of our target audience drops right then and there when we ask them to come to a clinic. So we lose our ability to affect before we've even started. Okay. Um, here we also looked at the effect of mobile health on other service use. So while we're delivering these interventions, what happened with the burden and time on all the other things that are going on at the clinic? Like vocational rehabilitation, like other psychosocial interventions, like their mid-management meetings. And so if you look at the focus lines, black line represents the three months preceding intervention. Gray line represents the three-month intervention period. Light gray represents the three-month follow-up period. And so we found that in mobile health, we saw a 9% reduction of use of other services during the treatment period, and an additional drop in services in the follow-up period. There, that's not even active. So people clearly in, integrated some of the focus skills into their repertoire, reducing their need for care. These effects were even more prominent in treatment responders. People that actually had self-reported reduction in their symptom severity, we're talking about 12% during the intervention period and 12% in the follow-up period. In terms of minutes, clinical minutes, minutes that a clinic provides, the, that's enormous. Okay. Last version of these interventions. Here is when we, we were talking about those invisible approaches. And here I'll briefly tell you about a system called CrossCheck. Um, this is a multimodal smartphone system that uh, uh, we co-developed with computer scientists at Dartmouth and Cornell. The idea is that there's self-reports, similar to what we have with Focus, but then we grab everything else that's happening on the smartphone. So we're looking at app use and call and text logs. We're repurposing GPS to identify someone's geospatial activity, microphone, light sensors, multi-axial accelerometers to give us as many digital indicators of behavior as possible. Now, of course, all this is knowingly, right? Patients know and volunteer and want us to partner with them to try to keep them out of the hospital. We're not the NSA, right? We don't do things on the fly. The idea is that all this is uploaded to a, to a remote server, it's processed, and we make the information accessible on a clinician dashboard. But aside from that, everything that's happening on the patient side, aside from some battery drain, is invisible. And so 
using that GPS, we can determine the distance that an individual covers during the day. We can determine the time that they spend at particular locations. So this is an objective answer to the question, are you leaving the home? Are you going to work? How much time are you spending at a particular location? Now that location could be a, a, a place that's really positive, but that location can be a bar, right? And so we can have eyes on that data. Indoors, when we deployed this in New Hampshire State Hospital, um, GPS signals are tough to get indoors, right, and, and sort of meaningless. And so what we did is we outfitted all the rooms on an inpatient unit with Bluetooth beacons. And so whenever someone moved through space, as they were answering questions, we were able to determine based on the strength of the signal how close they are to the nurse's station because we wanted to see whether there was a relationship between their proximity to nurses and violent ideation. There wasn't, by the way. We were relieved to see that. Okay, accelerometries, using standard APIs, we can determine someone's physical ac activity, whether they're walking or running or cycling, or the flip side of the same coin is the proportion of sedentary time, which we know is a huge predictor of a range of illnesses, but um, is affected and affects mental health. We spark up the microphone every, every few uh, minutes to capture ambient sound. And if our speech detection software detects speech, we can quantify the, the frequency of conversations and the duration of those conversations without actually recording the spoken word. And so it's privacy preserving. We'll know that you're talking to someone and how often you're talking to people. We won't know if you're talking about a drug deal or not, right? So we're not, we're not trying to model using paralinguistic features for that specifically. We also, there are limitations to this as well because the fact that you're in a, in, a, in a conversational environment does not necessarily mean that you're engaged in that conversation. So we can talk about some of the limitations of these approaches. Hopefully I'll have a couple of minutes at the end. But these are really hardly perfect, right? These are all digital inferences. Beyond that, we also have the objective digital behavior on the device, right? So we have call and text logs, traffic in, traffic out, length of messages, length of calls, um, when you're unlocking your device, how much time you're spending online. And so how does something like this actually play out with a patient? Here's an example for someone who was using CrossCheck, a patient with schizophrenia using CrossCheck for a year. Um, if you look at, oh, my arrow's not showing, so what I will do is show you that period. This represents their online activity with a device between midnight and 6 a.m. Really what we're after is sleep, right? So we can see that in the, in the 130 or so days before that, this person has pretty regular sleep uh, uh, patterns. Once in a while, turn, they'll turn on the device, but for the most part, they're, they're, they're sleeping. They're restful during that stage. Um, and then, if, then weeks before that blue line, which is a psychiatric hospitalization as a result of a suicide attempt, their sleep becomes irregular. So we don't know what they're doing online exactly, but we have strong indicators that they are in fact not asleep, right? And then they're hospitalized for a couple of weeks, they're stabilized, and look what happens upon discharge, their sleep patterns are back. Okay. So conceptually, what are we trying to do here, right? What's the big picture of this? We're collecting this mess of sensor data and uh, we're trying to hunt, right? But the hunt is not cross-individual. Um, the hunt is within individual over time. And so what we're looking for are meaningful events for that person, suicidal ideation, um, an arrest, hospitalization, when we have that, when we have that anchor point, we model back. We try to look for the unique combinations of sensor streamed, anchored sensor patterns that are those individuals' telltale signs that something is heading south. Something is changing for them. Once we have that, we try to calibrate our system, and so the next time around, when that pattern emerges, we're not so passive anymore. That's when we raise the red flag, and raising the red flag clinically means that on the one hand, we reach out to the, to the participant themselves with feedback, inquiring whether they've been taking medication, whether they need more support, and to the clinicians, in this case at Zucker Hillside Hospital in Long Island, and tell them, if you haven't been in touch with Joe lately, now might be a good time to reach out, because he might be struggling. Okay. 
So how do we bring all of this together, right? Where's the casting the vision piece? What I'll try to do is uh, give you a hypothetical vignette about Annie, who's a 22-year-old uh, young adult with, with early psychosis. Annie is not a real person. All the technologies that I'll be describing and the way that we're deploying them, that's all empirically derived. So everything here has already been published. We're, what I'm trying to do is just bring it together into one unified, expanded mental health assessment, monitoring, and ideally prevention approach. So about a year ago, Annie started feeling depressed. Um, she started hearing initially whispers and then what became derogatory voices. And the first attempt of this at, at finding out what this is, is she Googled it. So most people don't find out about mental illness from going to the mental health clinic. They will go online. In fact, one in three Americans seeks mental health information online. Think of those numbers. So once she realized that she might be at risk based on some of her experiences and she was directed to an online self-report mental health screener, it alerted her that she may need an additional assessment. And we know from research that the predictive value of an online psychosis screener is actually more accurate than in-person clinic screening. So to look at this more deeply, uh, she uh, recorded several prompted speech samples using her laptop computer. And we know that NLP, natural language processing systems with automated machine learning, have demonstrated promise in strengthening uh, the prediction of psychosis risk. In fact, there's research showing that some of these models are completely 100% accurate and determine who moves on from risk for psychosis to onset of psychosis. She's referred to an early psychosis clinic. They have a, they're, unfortunately, because they have this specialty care, they're two hours away, so her parents take the day off to drive her to that clinic. But, th but by then, the intake specialist has access to her NLP reports and can spend more time talking with her family about the nature of illness, their own stress and coping with this, rather than starting the process completely naive when she arrives at the clinic. She's also able to get a tour and understands that from now on, she might have access to a personalized digital health dashboard. She has various digital therapeutics that are accessible to her through the clinic uh, platform. And she, from this point on, does not necessarily need to come in using that two-hour drive. She can have two-way video telehealth services with her clinician. Like most of the adult population on the planet, um, she also has a smartphone, right? The majority of people with SMI, with serious mental illness, own mobile phones. And in fact, it's one of the few areas where the gaps between this hugely underserved population and the general population are practically non-existent, thanks to, thanks to subsidy programs. So people with serious mental illness have mobile devices. This becomes her primary platform for accessing services. And that means uh, community-based case managers using texting to effectively support our daily activities like the mobile interventionist that we described. It's cognitive remediation programs that help improve her executive functioning and her processing speed. It's being able to be supported at her work at the flower shop because she has an app, Joanne Nicholson's Working Well app that connects her with a, su a supported employment specialist that can give her on-the-job suggestions as she's feeling increasingly distressed from her interactions with her fellow employees. She was able to get that job as a result of VR job interview training specifically designed for people with psychosis. She's able to use focus as she's anxious before going into a, a lecture at her community college. In a corner of a corridor, she's able to relax and attend to, to the lecture, and on, and on, and on, right? Including using voice, uh, uh, voices avatars, being able to interact with the persona that, uh, that, that is attached to her voices to reduce her level of distress and manage them more effectively. And so, um, finally, as we're sort of thinking about, about how people are using these technologies, some of these tools are very sp are specialty tools, right, that groups like mine develop. Uh, but some of them are people creatively repurposing what is already out there. In fact, we find that 
People will post testimonials on YouTube describing psychotic symptoms and other uh, psychiatric events using the comment section as a virtual support community. So people are creative. Right? People will find a way to use digital assets to support their mental health care. And what I'll do is I'll end with a quick video from uh, one of our trips to Ghana where I'll show you uh, what we think the vision is for what's going to happen there. Um, because as we're developing these approaches, it doesn't have to be in sequence, right? In the same way that Ghana has leapfrogged access to technology, bypassing the need for desktops altogether, leveraging their very robust mobile cellular infrastructure and wide penetration of mobile phones, we think there's an opportunity not to go through the sequence that we have here before we get to Ghana, but rather work around and ideally get to the endpoints faster. So I'll, I'll end with this. How long have you been here? Three years now. Three years? Three years right in this room? Ghana, like most of West Africa, is facing a real mental health crisis. The gap between the enormous need and services is filled by traditional healers and prophets and other spiritual advisors. Oftentimes, this treatment comes with a host of human rights violations. You see people who have behaviors that are just difficult to contain, chained to trees or to concrete slabs and prayer camps for days, weeks, months, and even years at a time, forced confinement, forced fasting. They're not doing it as a punitive action. Even the traditional healers who engage in these practices are extremely interested in alternative solutions. In West Africa, there may be a gap in terms of access to mental health training and mental health resources, but there's certainly not a gap when it comes to the penetration of mobile devices. My area of research is mobile health tools in the study, assessment, treatment, and prevention of mental illness. Adopting the models that we used in the United States, I can easily imagine developing tools that are patient-facing texting interventions or smartphone apps that provide resources that are easy to understand using simple language or video, stigma-busting content, and practical skills to manage distress. Things that might support the providers, individuals who go out into the field and who might not have the training and expertise to manage complex mental health conditions. We're moving less and less from written interventions into audio and video-based interventions, and those are accessible to everyone. Keep in mind, half of the people that we show this to, half of the traditional healers, were illiterate. When we talk to them about trying to leverage their personal mobile devices as an instrument to get some sort of support that would allow them not to engage in these practices, across the board, they were remarkably open and interested in this. We've really seen an enormous amount of enthusiasm for the type of mobile health for mental health work that we do. The types of tools that we've developed in the United States can't just be taken and plopped down in the region. There needs to be contextual influence. We need to understand the appropriate languages, the behaviors. Ghana is the ideal setting for this first foray into this world. I think that the will is there. I think the capacities in terms of the technology is there. We just need to do it. Folks, thanks very much for your attention. I appreciate it.